In today's Bible study, we're going to be answering a question. Do I need to attend church to be a Christian? And I have heard that question countless numbers of times, not only in recent days, uh, but through the years, but especially post-pandemic. So many have left the church for various reasons, and many churches were closed, etc. There are a multitude of reasons as to why many have left the church, and many have begun to ask the question, with the advent of technology and online, etc., do I really need to attend a local church to be a Christian? And uh, I've written down some of the responses I've, I've heard from individuals and questions asked. Some of you have heard the same from friends and family. Uh, I've heard this just recently. Nowhere in the Bible does it command us to go to church. I heard an individual online the other day say, the early Christians never met together in church buildings. I heard another individual say, you can worship God anywhere, anytime. You do not need to attend a local church. I heard another person say, the church doesn't save us. Jesus does. And then I heard, as long as I believe in God and live a good life, I don't need to attend a church to prove anything to anyone other than God. And then I can't tell you how many times through the years, and you can just kind of insert your, your favorite activity or hobby, but I've heard people say, uh, the woods are my sanctuary, that's where I meet with God. Or uh, up at our camp, that's my sanctuary, that's where I meet with God. And uh, for many, it's the golf course on the weekend or whatever. Many people have this thought process that uh, wherever they want to meet with God, that becomes their sanctuary. And so in today's study, I'm going to address these oft-heard statements and uh, explain to you uh, whether or not they're true or false. And as a spoiler alert, uh, some of those things that were stated, some of those questions that I just read off uh, by individuals that have been sent in, people that have spoken to me personally, some of them are actually true. Uh, as always, we genuinely appreciate you uh, joining us in our Bible study, and many of them uh, that are listening are, are new. Uh, I see from data collected that somewhere between seven and 10,000 people a month are brand new uh, to our Bible study, and if you're brand new, uh, we just want to extend love and welcome to you as uh, either a believer or maybe not a believer, as a seeker, wherever you may be, uh, we welcome you to what is being called one of the largest online Bible studies in the world. Almost one million students a month now join us for our weekly content and we endeavor to do our best to answer the questions that are sent in by you, the viewer, and people that write the ministry at Lost Lamb Association, uh, we do our best. As I often say, I hope that I can earn your trust and become a trusted voice in your life for understanding the Bible, for understanding end times and Bible prophecy, which is a passion of mine. A lot of our content revolves around Bible prophecy and even answering these difficult questions that our viewers send in. And so if you enjoy content like this, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell, and that'll notify you as to when our weekly content is available. And so let's begin today, again, our study today, answering the question, do I need to attend church to be a Christian? And I'm going to lay this out for you in three parts. Many of you, as our advice is, get a way of taking notes, get a pen or a digital device, uh, be sure to get a highlighter, a Bible, and become a serious student of the Word with us. But the three things that I'm going to answer in our study today, number one, what is the church? Not what is my opinion or what is somebody else's ideology, but biblically, 
let's define right up front in our time together what is the church. The second thing that I'm going to be teaching is what the church is not. Because the church throughout history has evolved in many cases, and not wanting to be critical, but always being honest with you, there are many things in the world today called by the name church, and they do not meet the biblical definition of the church. So number one, we're going to explain biblically from original languages what is the church. Number two, what the church is not. And then conclude with number three, do I need to attend church to be a real Christian? So let's go into the book of Ephesians and the second chapter, and let's begin reading at verse 13, and I'm going to read down through verse 22. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 22, reading today out of the New Living Translation. The Bible says, but now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him, and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners, you are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Highlight that. You are members of God's family. Verse 20 begins by saying, together. Highlight that. Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. Verse 21, we are carefully joined together in him. Highlight that. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by His Spirit. As always, we're going to take a moment to pray. And by the way, if you're one of our new students from around the world that have recently joined our weekly Bible study, uh, there are hundreds of teachings and videos and studies on eschatology and Bible prophecy available to you. But I never do a broadcast without asking people if they're right with God. Do you have a clear, distinct memory of a time in your life when you've gotten down on bended knees in the presence of a holy God and repented of your sins and asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Because if you're listening and you're not sure if you're right with God, you're not sure that you have peace with God, if the Lord were to come today, you do not have a peace about your eternal destiny. When I'm done at the end of our study, I'd like the privilege of praying with you. There's nothing more important in all of the world than being able to lay your head to the pillow at the end of every day and know that your sins are forgiven and that you have peace with God. So I'm going to ask you to have the patience to be with us through the end of the study. And at that time, 
we'll pray specifically for you. But now as we begin our time and study, let's pray. Father, as we open the Holy Scriptures, we again recognize our complete and total dependence upon you and ask that by the Holy Spirit you would lead us and guide us into all truth. I pray for every single person listening, those who are listening live and the thousands and perhaps greater who will listen to this teaching in the days ahead my prayer for them is that they might feel the presence of God and the love of God, the calling and the conviction of God, and that they may have a desire to draw closer to you and to live every day ready to meet the Lord. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the wonderful truth it contains to guide our lives. Lead us in these moments together is our prayer, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. I am hearing, and to be bluntly honest with you, I am hearing a growing number of biblically illiterate people on social media making unqualified comments about the church and the bride of Christ and its history uh, and part of our Bible study today is a heartfelt concern that so many people uh, through social media, and thank God I'm using it as I speak, but it's a two-edged sword because there are many people who are speaking who are unqualified, and they're not students of the Bible, and they don't have proper understanding of Scripture, and they speak their ideologies and their opinions and views and dare lay their hands upon the Holy Church. And it brings me great concern because I have such a passionate love for the body of Christ, all of you, regardless of your denomination, my love for you, my honor for you, has nothing to do with what church you attend. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and you believe that the Bible is God's infallible and holy word, that's enough for you and I to begin a substantial relationship. I'm not one to judge, but I'm certainly not weak in backbone when dealing with false doctrine and heresies that have the potential of such great harm. So in today's Bible study, three questions that we're going to answer. Number one, if you're taking notes, what is the church? Number two, we're going to be dealing with what the church is not. And then number three, we're going to answer the very question that is the theme of our study. Do I need to attend church to be a Christian? Number one, what is the church? Now, let's just go straight into the Bible and not just your favorite translation, or even the English version of the Bible. But let's go all the way back to the original language of the New Testament, which is Greek. And in the original Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, the word church is ekklesia. Ekklesia. It's spelled E-C-C, -C, and occasionally you'll see it spelled E-K-K. But E-C-C-L-E-S-I-A, Ecclesia, is how it is pronounced. And it's translated in English Bibles as the word church. And it's found 114 times in the New Testament. Again, if you're one of our faithful and long-term students, you'll remember teachings that we've provided for you on the subject called the law of proportion. And in the circles of theology, the law of proportion is the more something is referenced in the Bible, it usually is a strong indicator as to the power and the potency of that term, that word, that subject. So considering the law of proportion and the word ecclesia, which is translated properly as 
church in an English Bible found 114 times in the 27 books of the New Testament, it is a valid and weighty subject that you and I should understand. It's actually taken from two Greek words. The first is ek, E-K, which means out of or out from. From the Greek, ek, E-K, out of or out from. And the second Greek word is kaleo, K-A-L-E-O, K-A-L-E-O, which simply is translated called or summoned. And so ekklesia from ek and kaleo simply means called out from and summoned. The word church from the original language is properly rendered a called out company or a called out assembly. And so as we begin our Bible study, if you're a brand new student of the scriptures and perhaps one of our brand new students here on this channel or our podcast or wherever you are listening, the word church from the original Greek manuscripts from the New Testament is ekklesia, translated as church, a formulation of two Greek words, ek and kaleo. Now, it's not critical to our study, but I will mention that there is some ongoing debate among some scholars over the etymology of the word ecclesia, but you are on solid theological foundations when we refer to the church as the called out assembly or the congregation or the gathering of believers. Now listen very carefully because what I'm about to give you is solid Bible gold because we know that the word church 114 times in the original Greek in our New Testament is not always applied the same way. And that is why sometimes there is a bit of misinformation and confusion. So I want you to be sure if you're taking notes, don't miss the four applications. Because in the New Testament, we have four and only four applications of the proper rendering of the Greek word ekklesia or church. And so if you're taking notes, number one, it represents the body of Christ worldwide under the full authority of Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. Let me give that to you again for those of you that take diligent notes. Number one, the word church in the New Testament has four specific applications. Understanding those four applications will help you to be well-rounded in your reading and understanding as to the value of the church from a biblical point of view. Number one, it represents the body of Christ worldwide and under the full authority of Christ who is the head of the church. Uh, As long as we're in Ephesians, let's go to Ephesians and the first chapter. Uh, Just back up one chapter, if you will. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23 is where we find just one example, and there are other examples, but to give you for all four applications, I want to give you at least one passage of Scripture for your notes and for your further study. Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church, ecclesia. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. And so the first proper translation 
usage of the word church, it can in the Bible refer to the church worldwide under the full authority of Christ who is the head of the church. Number two, the word church can also refer to God's people in specific regions. The word church, now remember, there's only four applications in the entirety of the New Testament for the proper rendering of the word church. Number one, it speaks about the church universal worldwide. Number two, in some passages, it refers to the church in its regional aspect and God's people in that region. Uh, let's go into the ninth chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9, and uh, go down to verse 31. Acts chapter 9 and verse 31, the church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, excuse me, Galilee and Samaria, and it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord. And with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. And so Acts 9.31, we find the church, same Greek word, ecclesia, had peace throughout, and then it names specific regions where believers were encompassed. Judea, Galilee, Samaria, and it became stronger and grew. Number three, the word church in the New Testament was defined as a local congregation of believers. And so again, the word ecclesia, 114 times in the New Testament, fulfilling the law of proportions for weighty, important matters in the eyes of God, was given an application in four specific references. Number one, it referred to the church worldwide. Number two, it referred to the church in regions. And number three, it referred to the church as local congregations of Christians. Uh, let's go into uh, 1 Corinthians and the first chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. I am writing to God's church, Ecclesia again, in Corinth. I am writing to God's church in Corinth, a localized congregation of believers. I am writing to God's church in Corinth, to you who have been called by God, to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. And so again, 114 times the word church is found in the New Testament. It has only four accurate applications. It can refer to the church worldwide. It can refer to the church in regions. It can refer to a local congregation in a localized context. And number four, it was also used to describe a group of Christians that were assembled together for worship, for the teaching of the scriptures, and for the move of the Holy Spirit. And uh, would to God I had a little, little extra time because those three things in the verse that I'm about to give you from the scriptures really is the essence of what a local church should be doing. And that's the fourth application of the word ecclesia from the Greek in the New Testament. The fourth application described a group of people who were gathered together, like we often do all of these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, doing the exact same thing, gathered together. But for what reasons? For worship, for the teaching of the word, 
and for the unique move of the Holy Spirit. Uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, go down to verse 26. Well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. When you meet together, one will sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given, one will speak in tongues, and another will interpret what is said, but everything that is done must strengthen all of you must strengthen all of you. And again, I want you to see the importance of the unity of the church. I want you to see that it was not an independent reference. Uh, as a matter of fact, let me give you a solid gold nugget. Don't miss this. And uh, perhaps later I'll share it in some of my other social media platforms as its own statement because it carries that much value. The word church was used in the New Testament always in the plural and never in the singular. So 114 times the word ecclesia in the New Testament translated in our Bibles as the word church Four applications, but all of those four applications have a commonality. And what is the commonality? It was always used in the context of plurality and never one single time in the singular. What do I mean by that specifically? Those who say that they can serve God without the church and stand on their own, separated from the church, dishonoring the church, negative comments about the church. Now, there are some churches, I'm just being transparent, there are some churches in existence, I understand why people leave. And there are reasons for leaving a church. As we get closer and closer to the rapture of the church, the Bible prophesied there would be an apostasy in the church and that there would be a weakening of the pulpit and of the sacred desk and preachers and teachers would prefer the applause of their congregations more than the approval of God. I get it. I've been in some churches, quite frankly, that I would never attend. So I'm not saying that there are not biblical reasons for leaving a local church, but I am going to show you as we go on in this study, you must never lose your, your honor and your love and your loyalty for the holy church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because in the Bible it is referred to as sacred and holy and the bride of Christ Christ called those who are true members of his church his bride. Now, I'm just going to tell you right now, if you're in my presence and you start speaking ill of my wife in my presence, we're going to go round and round and you're not going to like the outcome. I would never tolerate somebody slandering my wife in my presence. I'll just openly admit to you, I am not saved enough to promise you what may transpire should, should something like that happen? Well, how do you think Jesus feels when you or other people are slandering with no thought of what you're saying, slandering and speaking negatively of the church and saying, I'm done with the church. I don't need the church. I don't care about the church has never done anything, but all oh, they want your money. You know, and people slander carelessly not realizing that their tongue is touching things that are sacred in the eyes of God. Jesus himself, God's only son, shed his blood and purchased us so that the church may be sustained. So the word church, wherever it is used in the New Testament, is always plural in context, never singular. Number two, what the church is not. If you're taking notes, we've already covered, covered number one. What is the church biblically from original languages, original history, what the authors wrote in context, 
properly interpreted. It is applied in the New Testament in four specific applications, always plural. Number two, what the church is not. Now, throughout church history, the word church has evolved to mean many things to many people. But oftentimes, the way people use the word church, it has strayed miles away from its true biblical and holy definition. So let me tell you what the church is not. The church is not just a building. Now, I'm not saying that if you tell your kids or your grandkids or you tell your wife, let's go to church, and you're referring to a particular building. I'm not saying that's wrong. It's pretty common in our culture and in our mother language to refer to the building that has been built for worship for the gathering as the church. That's not wrong, but it is not the pure definition of what a church is. Because in the Old Testament, we see the word Ichabod, and I'll not get into the story of that, but from the original language, it means the Spirit of the Lord had departed. There are churches, there's not a visible sign that says Ichabod, but in the Spirit you can see it. The presence of the Lord has departed, and they have a building, and they may call it a church, and they may refer to it as a denominational name and, and call it church, but number one, the church is not a building. Number two, the church is not a social club. A lot of people love church, but they don't love it for holy reasons. They love it because they're lonely. They love it because of friendships. They love it because of free food. They love it because of the fellowship they have one with another. They love it because of music. They love it because of prayer. They love it because there's somebody there who will listen to the struggles they're facing and so on. But the church is not a social club. Number two, the church is not a social club. Number one, the church is not a building. Number three, the church is not a political organization. Now, I do believe that the church and believers should actively resist wickedness in morality, injustice, corrupt politics, I believe under the rapture of the church, the church should be actively resisting corrupted politics. But in some churches, that's all you ever hear. The church is not a political organization. Now again, I, I know some people might take that and run the wrong direction with it. I hope you heard what I prefaced my remarks with. The believer should resist political corruption, wickedness, ideologies from Satan and his children under the coming of the Lord. I vote. My wife votes. We believe in being functional American citizens. But I'm talking about those churches that almost every single service it is a diatribe on some political platform, and the church is not a political organization. Number four, the church is not a denomination. The Bible forbids denominations. And again, I'm not going to be legalistic and harsh on that. But when the rapture takes place, God's not going to call people based on their denomination. When we enter into the eternal kingdom of God, there are not going to be angels in eternity's morning saying Baptists this way, Presbyterians over here, Catholics this way, uh, Congregational Church of God, all you Pentecostals way back in the woods where you won't bother anybody. We're not going to be divided by denominations in eternity's morning. In God, there is no such thing as denominationalism. There is only the blood-bought and the redeemed. I think you'll be surprised in heaven there will be some people there you didn't think would make it from denominations that you didn't approve of. Because all that's required for salvation is to recognize your sin, repent of your sin, and receive Jesus Christ. And people have done that. They have recognized their sin. They have repented of their sin. They have received Jesus Christ in some denominational church buildings that many preachers would write off as apostate. God doesn't judge you by your title. He judges you by your testimony.
and your testimony needs to be in agreement with the standards of God's holy word. And then lastly, the church is not a replacement for the Jewish covenant. In the world of theology, it's called replacement theology. And what that means in a nutshell is there are a lot of Christians who believe that because the Jews rejected Jesus as the promised Messiah, that God then rejected the Jews and turned his love and covenant and attention to the Gentiles. And that simply is heresy. It is untrue. God's covenant with the Jews is everlasting. His covenant with the Jews will be fulfilled down to the jot and tittle. The promises of God to the Jewish and to the chosen nation are in prophecy, and God has not forgotten the Jews, and he will not forget the Jews. The church is not a replacement for God's covenant with the Jews. Lastly, and I close with this, is church attendance a requirement to go to heaven. Well, when you speak of church attendance, we have to to make exceptions. And listen carefully to what I'm about to say, because in a technical sense of the word, the answer to that is no. In a technical sense, listen carefully. Is church attendance required to be a Christian? In the technical sense of of the word, the answer to that is not debatable. It is no. The New Testament does not enforce a legalistic standard of maintaining perfect attendance in your church. Let me just be blunt. You can go to church every Sunday of your life and die and go to hell. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. You're not saved by attending a church. There are legitimate reasons, and hold on, some of you are already upset and your uh, heat and your collar is starting to rise, but hold on because you think I'm headed in a certain direction and I'm not. I am just saying that in the technical sense of the word, what do you say to the sick or to the infirmed who are going through some type of physical battle? And they cannot physically get out of bed or get dressed or go to a church. They they can't. They're at a season in life where they might be battling a disease or a sickness and they can't go to church. They may have gone to church faithfully their whole life. Are you telling that person because they went through a season of life where physically they were unable to go to church that now God is going to cast them into hell forever? That's just asinine. Also, sometimes elderly people lose their ability to drive, and uh, their local church doesn't provide any transportation, and they're forgotten. And uh, there are some people, as they get older, some people battle various eye conditions. They can't drive at night. They can't drive in rain. They can't drive in bad weather. Uh, And sometimes the elderly are put in a position where they may have attended church their whole life, but they're at a stage in in the fourth quarter of life where they're incapacitated for one reason or another, or they're limited. Are you going to tell those people who love the Lord as much at 85 as they did when they were 25 that now God forsakes them and judges them and casts them off because they can't get to church every single Sunday? Of course not. Uh, You know, where we live here in the state of Maine, I have friends that are uh, on this broadcast watching live from various states. I saw Wyoming. I saw Alaska. uh, I saw all kinds of people from climates that in the winter, there are times that the roads are covered with ice or there's blizzards, and it makes going to church unsafe and unwise. Uh, Quite frankly, I travel a lot, but when I'm away from home in the winter, I always tell my wife, Judy, Judy, if the roads are icy, or if the roads are unsafe, or if there's snow and it presents a condition where you're traveling to church is not a wise choice, I want you home. 
I want you safe. I don't want you risking your life to prove your devotion to the Lord. God knows your heart. Now, do I think that because there's a blizzard or an ice storm and my wife doesn't go to church on a Sunday that the rapture takes place, she'll be left behind? Anybody that has a view like that should not be allowed in your circle of influence. Anybody that low-minded, that unlettered, that judgmental, you should stay away from. There are people within the sound of my voice. There's not a local church near you. I always tell people, you should attend a Bible-believing church with a godly pastor. And I mean that. And I support that. And I've preached that for 40 years. But I've had people saved on our YouTube channel who have written the office and said, there's not a church within 460 miles of where I live, all the way up in uh, Arctic regions, northern Canada, and various places of the world. There aren't local churches with godly pastors. They don't have an option. And they oftentimes write to me and say, Tiff, I don't have a local church. And some do have local churches, but they're not preaching the Bible. They've gone woke. And they're preaching the ideologies of a corrupt and wicked world in which we live and corrupt and wicked political systems and the Bible's been tossed out. You shouldn't go to that church just to prove to God that you love the church and sit under that filth and that corruption and that idolatry, that perversion. And people will write to me and say, until I find a church, is it wrong for me to consider you my church? You're the only thing I have in my part of the world and, you know, people in third world countries and countries where Christians are persecuted and killed and burned alive. They can't go to church. They do meet at homes. I've been in third world countries. I've preached the gospel in over 60 countries of the world. I've been in those places where they can only meet on an occasion and secretly, and they have to continually change where they're going to meet lest they establish a pattern where they can be detected by spies. So is it wrong for a person who doesn't have a local church or lives in a third world country where there are no churches, or a persecuted country where they have to strategize on how they get together? Is it right for us to say that at Judgment Day, though they love Christ, though they believed in their heart, repented of sin, are studying the Scriptures, doing the best they can, are we going to look those people in the eyes and tell them, because you didn't go to church every Sunday, you broke the Ten Commandments. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. You have to be in church at least once a week to get into Are we going to interpret the Bible that foolishly and that legalistically? I sure hope not. Because there are legitimate reasons why people can't get to church. I think of a lady who got saved through our YouTube ministry. Uh, she's a hairdresser, I believe owns her own uh, company in, in Nevada. And uh, she has messaged and written the office and myself and, and said, is it wrong for me to consider you to be my pastor? I, I'm trying to find a local church and, and I just have been unsuccessful. I pray, listen, I pray that you can find a local church. But I also am aware of the fact that in this wicked age in which we live, they are becoming fewer and far between. And many people are struggling to find a Bible-believing church with a godly pastor. Until you do, I would welcome the opportunity to serve in some capacity as a shepherd in your life, as someone that you can trust to study the Bible once a week. And a lot of people do that. Our channel for many people around the world, they get together on Sunday in a home. They play one of our broadcasts. They sing, they worship. They act as one of the four applications of the church that I mentioned to you out of the New Testament because they don't have another option. Now listen carefully, and if I haven't offended you yet, I'll offend the rest of you right now. But these reasons are not to be compared with those who do, did not attend church, do not attend church because the preacher didn't shake their hand or somebody offended them in church or somebody said something about their haircut and now they're at home crying 
and uh, I'm, I'm giving up on God. People just don't appreciate me and validate me. And I, I, I prayed about that color before I had my beautician dye my hair that color. And Christians are so in, you know, people give up on God and quit the church for a lot of carnal reasons. And a lot of people leave the church because it's football season or because they're traveling around the state following their children or their grandchildren to cheerleading clinics and soccer tournaments and ice hockey and on and on and on. And sporting events have become more prominent in their life than the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am not comparing the previous reasons for not being able to go to church with those who for carnal reasons have left the church. The cost of following, listen, the cost of following Christ is high and it's holy. And I fear that on judgment day, some of you are going to discover in the presence of God that your excuses for not attending church are not going to be tolerated. Your excuses on earth will not be tolerated in heaven when you stand before God on judgment day. The cost of following Christ is high and the church is his bride and the church is holy and the church is sacred. Go with me into the book of Luke and the 14th chapter. Luke and the 14th chapter and go down to verses 26 through 28 and listen to these words of Jesus. If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. One scholar wrote these words. Listen carefully. When God constituted the people of Israel, he organized them into a visible nation and placed upon them a sober and sacred obligation to be in corporate worship before him. If a person is in Christ, he is called to participate in the fellowship of other Christians and the worship of God according to the precepts of Christ. If a person knows all these things and persistently and willfully refuses to join in them, would that not raise serious questions about the reality of that person's conversion? There is a serious problem when those who claim to be Christians have an apathetic attitude towards the church and towards church attendance. Another scholar wrote these words, quote, Christians should be committed to their local church, involved in their local church, and supportive of their local church. This requires regular church attendance. A believer will naturally love his brothers and sisters in Christ, and that love will manifest itself in a desire to fellowship with them, not in avoidance. When the church is praising the Lord, all believers should want to join in the praise. When the church is praying, all believers should want to join in the prayer. When the church is studying the word, all believers should want to join in the learning. I conclude with this. If you don't have this verse highlighted in your Bible, let me take the time to go there with you. Hebrews and the 10th chapter, verses 23 through 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together. Highlight that. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. Notice that all the way back in the first century church, that there were weaker carnal Christians 
who did not want to acknowledge the necessity of the church and did not want to take time to attend. Now for them, many it would be walking. They didn't have vehicles or buses or trains or subways. They walked long distances. And you can understand why there would be perhaps uh, more of a, uh, an individual in New Testament days, first century church, who found it hard to be faithful to church. I'm just pointing out that the problem has existed from the very infancy of the church all the way to our current age. But the Bible said, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I close with this. The question that matters in eternity, don't miss it. The question that will matter in eternity, when you stand before God and give an account for your life, I can assure you the question's not going to be, how many times did you go to church? The question is going to be, what did you do with my son, Jesus Christ? You will never have an understanding of the church any greater than your love of Jesus Christ. People who devalue the church in their life and in the practice of their faith don't want to admit it, but when the church is no longer special to you, when the church is no longer sacred to you, when you no longer see this as a part of the commandment of God to be a part of the bride of Christ, to honor it, to love it, to pray together, to sing together, to worship together, to give together, to, to fellowship together, it usually is a pretty good indication that your own personal fire is going out. You cannot survive without the church. Now, I'm an outdoorsman. Many of you know that. And uh, sometimes people like me, we just enjoy sitting by a fire and uh, looking at what God has created and decompressing and praying or being with friends. But you know what I've learned in all of my years of building fire? You can have a perfectly built fire, but if you take a stick out of the fire and lay it on the ground by itself, do you know what happens 100% of the time? And it depends on the wood and it depends upon the oil content or fat wood, etc. But that stick will eventually extinguish. The fire will go out. The coals may last for a bit, but that fire in that stick that thrived in fire will go out when you place it on its own. That's what I'm trying to teach you today. You need the fellowship of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, there's no such thing as a perfect pastor. Why are you so hard? Why are you so judgmental? Not everybody has the same capacities. Not everybody has the same theology. Not everybody has the same IQ. That's human nature. Don't be hard on your pastor. If they've been faithful to the church, if they show up and they open the word of God and it becomes evident that they pray and they're making an effort and they're loving the, the people and doing the best that they can, don't be so hard upon your pastor. Don't be so hard upon the worship team. Don't be so critical of things that offend you. Don't on the way home from church services chew and spit and squabble. It's God's church. There's no such thing as a perfect church. There's no such thing as a perfect pastor. There's no such thing as a perfect congregation. And if you ever find a perfect church, don't go there. You'll spoil it. There's no such thing. It's the bride of Christ. It's holy. It's the commandment of God. Remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. And the New Testament, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Love the church. Be a part of the church. Because if you try to separate yourself from the holy church of the Lord Jesus Christ like a stick pulled out of the fire, no matter how hot the blaze was, when you leave, your fire will go out and perhaps you'll be left behind. I say that with all sincerity. 
because I want you to be ready to meet the Lord. If you're listening to me right now and you're not sure if you're ready to meet the Lord, I never teach, I never preach, I never close a broadcast, a podcast without taking time to pray with you. Can we pray right now? Would you just be honest enough to say, Lord, I'm not where I should be, but I want to be right with God. You have to recognize your sin. You have to repent of your sin. You have to receive Jesus Christ. And when you're done praying with me, I want you to go to our website. It's on the screen, lostlamb.org. And I want you to click on New Beginnings. I have materials there that I've provided specifically for you, all free. All our content is free. I really care about you, and I want you to grow in your faith. So when we're done praying, go to lostlamb.org and click on New Beginnings and begin listening to those teachings until you thoroughly understand. Because this isn't the end of what God's going to do in your life, just the beginning. Will you pray with me? Wherever you're at right now, just say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. Down deep in my heart, I want to be a real Christian. I recognize my sin and I repent in childlike faith. I turn my back on sin and turn my heart to Jesus Christ. Come into my heart now and be my Lord and my Savior and give me a love for the bride of Christ. Make me a part of the true church. May I serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.